Hi, everyone. I um, think it's time to get started. I'd like to welcome you to today's panel discussion, the third in New York Nogos masterclass series on retail media. Um, last week, we took the perspective of retailers who all want to monetize their sites and get extract as much money also from the brands. Um, today, we're taking a different perspective. Um, it's about the brands who want to get as much return on the advertising investments in retail media. So today's topic is push and pull, creating a full funnel retail media brand strategy. My name is Andreas. I'm founder and CEO of Creolytics. Um, I've spent quite a while in retail. It's um, around about 15 years now. Um, um, Creolytic is offering um, a software platform to run sponsored products um, in a private marketplace environment. So I'm quite familiar with retail media as well. Um, and um, I'm joined today by two experts, people I know in person and really appreciate. So let's welcome um, Ajay Kapoor. Um, Ajay is um, currently working at Helen of Troy, where he leads the digital transformation for multinational world-class world brands, including Brown, Revlon, and OXO. Um, he was previously at Shark Ninja, where he transformed um, their sales and marketing and product capabilities for the digital age. Um, I'd also like to welcome Dan Akko, um, who's managing marketing at Pepsi. Um, Dan's role is um, to determine Pepsi's e-commerce strategy where he operates a massive um, retail media um, budget and collaborates with um, shopper marketing and brick and mortar sales teams to drive omni-channel um, initiatives. Um, before we get into the content and get really started, um, a few housekeeping items. So um, you have no need to record the session now with your mobile phone. Um, simply wait until we share the recording with you guys. Um, and if you have questions, feel free to post them in the Q&A box. Um, and um, don't forget that we have a fourth series as well. So next week, it's about um, something a little bit more um, entertaining, I would say. We show you many examples on how retailers actually monetize their websites, creative strategies on how to create uh, media, and also um, showing some good and not so good examples of um, ads um, on different marketplaces and retail sites. So it's a bit um, a fun session next week and um, would be happy to welcome you again. Um, with this, um, let's um, get right into um, the content. Um, and um, yeah, as I just gave a very brief introduction, um, let's start with um, you, Dan. Um, I mean, you oversee a seven figure um, media um, budget across all major channels at Pepsi. Can you just um, explain a little bit what your role is and how this um, relates to um, Pepsi's omni channel strategy? Yeah, happy to, and uh, great to be here with you, Andy and Ajay, um, and thanks for, for having me. So yeah, so I've uh, been at Pepsi a little more than uh, a year, uh, come from a uh, strong uh, ad tech, uh, media, and marketing background. So uh, really, I was brought on to, uh, for my DTC marketing experience, uh, spent some time in the mattress industry before this, uh, to kind of bring that mindset to CPG marketing. And so... What that looks like for us in Pepsi is, you know, uh, food and bev shopping online. You know, we've seen, of course, substantial increases since uh, COVID, but, you know, we've been focused on that for a number of years with a sort of dedicated e-commerce organization of uh, now growing right beyond a couple hundred people. So specifically, I oversee a couple customers, um, two large global retailers, and uh, beyond just sort of... Uh, focusing on, uh, you know, how we're spending our dollars on low funnel performance marketing, driving sales of the full PepsiCo, Frito-Lay, Quaker portfolio uh, across those uh, organizations, both uh, online and offline, but also really um, leaning into those relationships and sort of the strategic conversations about um, what we can kind of uh, unlock and kind of advance capabilities together. Um, Dan, we know Pepsi, we all know Pepsi from the physical world. And um, initially I was kind of surprised that um, online is actually um, something uh, which um, seems to be important now for Pepsi. So um, can you explain a little bit um, what role um, e-commerce is playing for Pepsi these days and whether this should become a major distribution channel going forward or is it um, rather being used for branding and communication? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, 
Um, with this omni-channel view, we initially started this e-commerce organization as sort of a, a startup within the larger company to kind of have a dedicated approach, right? And so we uh, definitely have been a little bit ahead of the pack kind of starting that around five years ago uh, and have been, you know, in an opportune place to sort of see this massive acceleration, especially this year, right? Uh, we've seen maybe a five-year acceleration, especially in e-grocery kind of buying food and beverage online uh, in just, right, the last, you know, three to six months. So, you know, what that looks like, right, is um, people are uh, are now shopping, right? Uh, the brick and mortar shoppers are turning into omni-channel shoppers. That sort of proves out to be a larger, uh, more valuable customer. Um, and so we focus on sort of connecting those dots in the relationship, making sure that we are uh, investing, driving sales online with those physical retailers. Um, they often offer, right, very specific marketing levers. We're making sure that we are, um, both working with our, uh, our media and our, our sort of our offers or trade budgets to sort of put the right promotions in front of the right people at the right time um, and make sure that we are sort of, uh, you know, set for the future as more and more sort of online and offline and omnichannel shopping uh, happens um, as food and bed becomes, you know, a bigger part of that uh, as a late sort of entrant to the e-commerce game, if you will. Thanks, Dan. Um, hey, RJ, um, when we met the first time, you were still at Shark Ninja. Um, since then, you already moved on. But let's start with Shark Ninja a little bit. What did you do there and how does this relate to retail media? Just share some of your um, experience and explain a little bit what you did there. Yeah, Andy, uh, Andy, Mark, uh, Creolytics team, thanks for having me. Excited to have this conversation. It is the Wild West, to say the least, as we walk into the retail media world. Uh, so prior to Shark Ninja, was at P&G uh, working on reinventing that brand building organization, how digital media was transforming on that front. And then when I went to Shark Ninja, the, the focus was kind of a centralized digital transformation capability. Uh, disrupt ourselves before we got disrupted. And for folks on the call, Shark uh, Ninja makes shark vacuums, Ninja blenders, coffee makers, uh, pots and pans. Uh, it's the largest appliance maker in the world. And broadly, my focus there was pulling together the total omni-channel view of how the business needed to operate. Uh, building a new muscle, which was this digital transformation, thinking through our omni-channel selling capabilities, helping our retailers move from offline uh, to online uh, and getting the right mix there, as well as moving some of our DTC capabilities from more analog DRTV to uh, online and DTC in the, the way that we know it today. And so what I was able to kind of have a visibility against was what are the conversations that were happening at a brand media standpoint? What was the conversations happening at a shopper marketing trade marketing standpoint and how do you stitch together you know this crazy acceleration that we're seeing as consumers move further online the growth of amazon and the growth of you know uh, retail.com uh, across the board and to your point as you kicked off making sure that we were investing the dollars in the most uh, fiscally responsible way to get the right consumer at the right time at the right place to choose us versus our competition um, when I um, looked at your current ro current role at um, Helen of Troy, um, where you are overseeing um, global marketing, digital DTC, um, I realized this um, um, position might not have existed a few years ago yeah. because it you seem to um, overlook quite a few functions, which in many other companies seem to be completely discoordinated. Um, Can you explain a little bit um, why this um, position exists and what you are doing there ex exactly? Yeah, broadly, the vision of the role is one consumer experience, regardless of where that consumer is. And so there are a lot of acronyms to the title, but broadly speaking, if you think about awareness acquisition, uh, point of purchase, DTCretail.com, uh, as well as our post-care loyalty, uh, have a contact center and call center that rolls into me. We want to make sure we're surprising and delighting our consumers at any and all touch points. And the realization is as we move further online and COVID's just poured, I don't know, gasoline's probably the wrong analogy, uh, you know, just has fully accelerated it forward. Uh, consumers are far more savvy than ever before, uh, and they're looking for an amazing experience across any and all touch points. 
And so again, it's it's a complicated world is the simple way of putting it. Uh, and you have publishers that are traditional uh, that have been there, TV networks moving to OTT. Uh, you have retailers that are now becoming publishers. And so the question is, how do you stitch this together? How do you make sure at your point of purchase, you're winning uh, both with that overall experience as they land on those PDP pages, the product uh, description pages across brand.com, retail.com, or at shelf. Uh, and then what do you need to do to supplement and augment them to, to you know, lean your way versus competition or not purchasing in the category? Seems that um, all major brands now want to go DTC. And I mean, it's quite obvious why, because it's a tough market, tight margins, um, kind of no customer lifetime value if you don't own the relationship directly. So DTC might be the silver bullet and an escape. But if you then take the consumer perspective, um, you would probably rather more easily buy through um, Amazon where you have your account, you put like 50 different products into the basket and you easily buy it. Um, then, especially um, in your case with Pepsi, there's also a DTC um, strategy. Can you um, outline a little bit um, why DTC should play a role in the future and um, how Pepsi is approaching this? Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's a, a really interesting subject area, one I'm, I'm passionate about. Um, less of my focus these days, but certainly part of the overall you know, strategy at Pepsi. So Pepsi this year you know, kind of moved pretty quickly. Um, on a couple of big projects, snacks.com is one, and then pantryshop.com is the other, both sort of launched mid-pandemic to kind of address some of the changing needs for consumers to kind of shop online, especially when the grocery stores and everything were, you know, uh, closed or, you know, scary to kind of go into for periods of time. And so, you know, those continue to be places where we can uh, experiment with new, new offers, new bundles, new ways to kind of... Uh, you know, reach the consumer directly, get some data, run some experiments. Um, and uh, I'd say along with, uh, you know, individual sort of sites like that, you know, we have a big opportunity with our, our brand sites, right? And so our brands have been operating on sort of a direct consumer basis, not really from a sales standpoint, right? But we've always had, of course, Cheetos, Pepsi, Quaker, you name it, right? Whatever the, uh, the brand, strong brand presence, social media, brand advertising, digital, right? And so, I think what we're seeing is uh, just a way to sort of capture that sale in some cases and other are ourselves, right? And in other cases, send it over to uh, to the retailer, sort of a DTC2 retailer sort of mindset, if you will, right? But, you know, ultimately, I, I think those will still be places for us to play and learn. But, you know, just based on volume and sheer scale, right? We, uh, you know, and to your point about where consumers shop in general and where they're going to kind of add a 12 pack of Pepsi to their cart or 12 pack of bubbly, right. Um, along with the rest of their grocery trip, it just makes so much more sense, uh, to have that prioritized. And so we do see the retailers as kind of the focus of our, our overall strategy, um, both, you know, e-commerce and, uh, offline. Um, RJ, um, we have lots of clients in the fashion space um, and they sell a pretty broad range of products and fashion historically has worked pretty well for DTC um, already. But even there, what we see is that um, customer acquisition costs are really high because the assortment is narrow and um, you will never ever be able to match the conversion rate someone like an Amazon um, has. Then um, it's um, also logistics costs with, which are hitting. So, um, I mean, the risk I see is that um, all these um, factors um, kind of um, um, eat up the benefits you would have to the DTC channel. Why does Helen of Troy believe um, that this is a future opportunity and how do you want to make it work? Yeah, I, 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 let me attack this just from a more macro standpoint and then I can talk specifically. Look, I, I think I was at PNG day four for me was the day that the viral video for Dollar Shave Club dropped. And let me tell you, right, uh, Gillette was held, uh, was flat footed. And I think what manufacturers are realizing is that they need to go through a broader digital transformation. The consumer journey is changing. Uh, consumer trust matters. And I agree with you 
that DTC is challenging. You look at, I think Scott Galloway had a great blog post about Casper and the unit economics on Casper. It was, it was great. It was, the cartoon's amazing. Um, but broadly speaking, you know, you have some challenges as retailers move online. Uh, you have three P's that are popping up. You have uh, products that are not authentic, you know, filtering into the marketplace. If that's on Amazon and now as Walmart opens up the broader marketplace capabilities. So I do think consumers are changing and brands being able to meet those needs across any and all touch points is really critical. Uh, I think retail is fundamentally important for any player. And I, we were talking, Andy, uh, picking on Dollar Shave Club. There's a reason why they need to go on me and they're going to, uh, you know, Walmart right now and expanding. It's really hard to get the unit economics and the P&L to work just DTC only. And you see that with many of the DTC players that have disrupted many of the categories. If that's, you know, uh, mattresses where Dan previously came from or shaving. Um, so I think for many brands is understanding the role that DTC needs to play. Uh, knowing that retail's there and retail is ever so important uh, to that to that journey is it acquisition of first party data that allows you to have, in essence, your own panel uh, that you can learn, test, grow, uh, product innovation, get voice of consumer to further penetrate. Is it extended assortment? Is it launching novel new concepts that would be difficult to launch at retail? Uh, is the brand trust and uh, being having an authentic relationship? I, I would just share that I think there's many ways of slicing this and brands having uh, specific vision and goals and measurables against that is really critical. Uh, I use Nike as an example. They went digital first, you know, a DTC first, uh, and it's been a huge, huge uh, you know, growth factor for them as they've looked at the retail channels differently and they've looked at that relationship with that consumer differently. And so I, I again, I think it's brand to brand, manufacturer, manufacturer, and then just getting very focused on what's the role of DTC versus your other channels, uh, knowing that consumers need to be one agnostically. Uh, it is not us to dictate where consumers want to purchase. It is for a consumer to choose. We just got to show up uh, and we got to do our best when we do show up. Okay, then let's rephrase my question. How do you get the consumers to choose to buy from you directly? Because it's apparently uh, obviously not the most convenient way if you have an alternative and ca can buy on Amazon. But what reasons do you give them? Yeah, I, I, again, I would say assortment can play a factor. One, I, what I call it is what's the broader value prop? Why do they come to you versus anyone else? Uh, and just work off of the default that they want to go somewhere else versus you. And so what's the unique value proposition that you're providing? Is that subscription bundling? Is that a, you know, offer, promo, et cetera? Get very clear and get very focused on what that needs to look like. And then two, don't try acquiring mass market. Uh, figure out who your segmentation and consumer for DTC is going to be and go win-win them. Uh, and figure out how you find that loyal, you know, multi-buyer shopper. Those are your brand advocates. Uh, and you likely have a pathway in to build a relationship. Uh, and hopefully those folks are driving either ratings or reviews, word of mouth, et cetera, and driving expansion that halos back into retail.com. The last thing I'll say is, you know, at Shark Ninja and other places, we use DTC as a leverage model. It was a mechanism to get more media dollars and more media weight out there. And, you know, we ran the business at, at a break even um, or at a loss uh, and it mattered strategy and category wise. But the goal was drive category awareness, put more media dollars out there uh, and then hopefully win, you know, our fair share or above fair share for the category. And that was a win win for retail as well as DTC. And I'm, I'm very curious what your take on this is. It seems that for a brand like, like Pepsi, it's um, eventually even more complex to make this work. What's the thinking behind this? What's the strategy? Yeah, I mean, it's tough, of, of course, with, with Pepsi. And, and you can imagine shipping uh, heavy beverages to your home uh, in large pack sizes uh, is not ideal, nor is uh, packaging uh, a set of easily crumblable uh, chips, your Cheetos could easily turn into Cheetos dust if uh, we don't package those correctly, right? But uh, even, you know, going back to what, what Ajay was saying, um, you know, thinking about uh, my time in the, in the mattress space um, and 
that was sort of an interesting thing because that was so new and people were sort of becoming actually trained, right, to kind of buy a mattress from an individual brand of website. DTC was kind of the, um, the default, right, as opposed to, it, in most cases, not being the default. I buy my soda or my, or my uh, you know, my sharks at, um, you know, at a retailer, right? I think for for Pepsi right now, um, you know, I do think the value prop, like uh, Ajay was saying, is a huge part, like pantry shop kind of like bundling opportunities or subscriptions, I think can be a good reason. Um, I think we were doing some uh, some donations as well to, uh, you know, to frontline workers during the pandemic, right? And so I think that's part of it too, things you can't necessarily activate as easily with, uh, you know, with your partners over at Amazon, Walmart, Target, et cetera. So, um, you know, I think loyalty too, we've got, you know, different programs going on constantly, whether it's, um, you know, food stakes or related to like our big media campaigns or um, pep coin, right? Where you kind of earn points, right? For different products you buy. So I think some of those things too are easier uh, to kind of drive to your own site, have them sign up for an account that way and kind of get them in, into your ecosystem, right? So, but, you know, it's not, again, I, I, it's unlikely to kind of be the default way that people do this type of shopping. Um, but yeah, if you offer them something exclusive as a new channel to sort of say, oh, we've got this new innovation coming out. Can we launch DTC first? We're doing that, I think, as an experiment. Um, we're looking into that next year with a new product called Driftwell, right? Back to sleep. And that's just going to like a drink, right? That'll kind of help you sleep better. So using it right kind of in these strategic areas, I think, is where we're thinking about it right now. Um, where it goes in the future, I think we're sort of like open minded, like, let's see what happens, you know? With DTC now also being in the mix, um, this um, puts some challenges on the organizations and um, the question is how to structure things. And what I observed is that um, sometimes companies who have a major DTC presence, they have um, digital advertising experts executing campaigns in a very sophisticated way. Um, at the same time, now there are opportunities to run a sponsored product program on Amazon or Walmart, which requires a similar skill set. But the, as DTC is completely separate from, um, from the retail or marketplace part, um, the question is who should now manage what? Um, um, maybe the two of you, um, how are you organized there? I'll let you start. Okay. Uh, look. I think, Andy, what we've talked about is many of these manufacturers are on their journey, uh, some further ahead than others. Candidly, my N of one opinion uh, is centralizing. Centralize your total media uh, acquisition. The rub is how do you do that against brands and customers and figure out the matrix component around that, but you need subject matter experts driving the car. And the rub is... Uh, right now, I feel that uh, sales folks across the, the country are getting clipped at the knee uh, because they're being pushed into very challenging conversations of saying, you need to support us offline, you need to support us online. And uh, by the way, we came up with the plan, uh, but the plan may not actually help to drive uh, your business and may help to drive the total category, et cetera. And so our ability to have a voice at the table uh, from a marketing standpoint and a collective omni-channel media strategy standpoint is really, really critical. And yes, we have to support our retails, retailers, uh, but we also have to see some of those retailers do two things in my mind. One, uh, figure out how we're moving some of the offline dollars that were previously allocated to online as consumers move. And then two, Uh, the reporting next to it. If you want to be a publisher, you got to report like a publisher. And I, I feel like that's a fair standard to put upon this conversation and, and building that jointly. That may not be right out of the gate, but having a shared vision between the customer and the manufacturer is so critical. Having the open partnership and conversations between the media teams on both sides with the buyer and the sales individual in the room is so critical. It's messy, but it's worth it. Yeah, I would say from, uh, you know, Pepsi's perspective, we are uh, continuing to shift how we think about that organization. Um, right now, right, we've got a lot of dedicated customer teams to kind of each retailer, right? And so, uh, you know, a handful of marketers, sales folks, and, and other people, right, dedicated to your Targets, Walmarts, Amazons, et cetera. But we are sort of continuing to rethink that model um, 
in, in a lot of different ways, including from, from marketing, because we're starting to see more and more overlap. Whereas, you know, uh, e-commerce was sort of set up as its own individual uh, org within the company, almost like a startup, you know, within the larger corporation. Um, now that we are sort of working much more cross channel and with our brick and mortar counterparts and things are becoming omni-channel, it's all kind of blending together. So we're certainly experiencing that shift really quickly, more quickly than anticipated this year uh, and already starting to see some movement, you know, around the company, not sort of drastic changes yet, but around, you know, how do we rethink this? Because uh, one example, right, uh, I work on our target account and, you know, we've got a, uh, a shopper marketer with a significant budget who drives all of her dollars uh, toward digital media because Target doesn't have any opportunities uh, for media really in stores, you know, very small. They have this, like clean store policy. And so if she's running, you know, ads on their website through the retail media network, leveraging that first party data, and I have my own budget to do the same thing. Now that my business is getting bigger and my e-commerce, you know, budget is getting bigger too, we're starting to kind of figure out how we overlap and where we need to invest versus where she needs to invest, how much is too much, you know, what's not enough, how much do we tell the retailer we actually have versus, you know, how much are we, you know, looking at the business and, and attributing those dollars to. So uh, it's, uh, it's a definitely in a, in a state of transition, I'd say right now. Um, RJ, one observation, um, I was really surprised when I saw this, you um, know that many retailers are running a private markets approach. So um, for, for example, sponsor products, which is a one-to-one -one relationship between brand and retailer. And at the same time, there are networks like Gritio where the brand spends on a network of different retailers. And we've seen that um, the one hand doesn't know what the other hand is doing. So basically this budget coming from the media agency from one brand, massive budgets being spent on a specific retailer. And at the same time, uh, the um, guy, the sales guy who deals directly with the retailer submitted his own budget and the, the, the agency didn't know about the other thing and vice versa. How can something like this happen in today's world? Yeah, see that all the time. Uh, and it, it's it's great for one side of the coin, probably not great for the manufacturer side. Look, I, I think we're just in an evolution. Uh, I think we've been talking about digital transformation for probably 10, 15, 20 years now. But I think the rubber's hitting the road, to be very frank, as retailers, consumers, and shoppers move online in a more meaningful way, at least in their path to purchase, they may still buy at shelf but that overall journey has been deeply shaped by, you know, what's possible and available from your mobile phone or your computer or elsewhere. And so, you know, candidly, this comes back to the rec of that I provided to you, Andy, is like centralized. Uh, I know no one likes giving up control and there's constituents sitting around, have the tough conversations, but it's better not to overspend. It's better not to double subsidize a particular sale uh, or not get enough run rate for each dollar you're putting out there. All, all that's happening at the most macro level is you're not growing top line, you're not growing net new users, and you're diluting the bottom line. And so I think more folks that can understand that common P&L that ties back to the brand, the better, and understand where those investment dollars are going, uh, because the end goals are still the same. Grow the brand, grow the retailer, and win. Uh, but do it in the smartest way possible. There seems to be quite a confusion as well around trade versus media budget. Um, Ajay, if you invest into sponsored products and um, retail media, um, what from what budget is this coming from and how do you decide whether it's media or trade? Yeah, I, you know, candidly, I, I'm agnostic uh, because I can get visibility both at Shark Ninja and uh, Helen Troy across the totality of that media spend. It's a financial exercise, but we we track those things. Um, you know, previous world, again, what I'll share, PG elsewhere, talking to other manufacturers, uh, to your point, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing. Uh, and the rub, candidly, is you have, you know, a couple touch points with your retailer. You, you have your joint business plan, where there's commitments that you're making to support that business, to get slotting, to do the things that that uh, are available on that front. And many of those are legacy agreements that have just been carried over year over year over year. Uh, and the negotiation there is on like logistics or other things. But the realization is the consumer change. So you have to relook at those agreements. Those are difficult conversations. 
Two is uh, your sales team's getting hit saying you need to support us online. Online is really important. Uh, we as a buying team are, you know, being judged both on offline and online sales. Uh, and so those sales folks to our previous conversation uh, may not have the tool set uh, ready to have that digital conversation. I have no doubt many of the sales folks on this call elsewhere know how to get a display up, how to get POP up and how to rock and roll better than probably the folks that are talking right now in store. Um, but we need to be able to augment, educate, and help support that. And then third is making sure any brand dollars are coordinated with those trade dollars. Um, but in broad strokes, uh, there's a lack of coordination across those buckets, uh, and there's competition. And in many cases, the players that win are Google uh, and the retailer sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, Dan, would you see um, trade budget um, as... Um, as an investment or is it rather a cost factor and compared to this, um, how do you see the media budget? Yeah, so I mean for us, uh, you know, the finance team definitely uh, is very strict about where what is trade and, and what is A&M and so, uh, you know, it, it's as simple for us as, you know, trade dollars generally owned by the sales teams um, and they fund offers, uh, whether that, you know, be online, omni-channel, etc. And then you know, uh, media dollars being A and M, and that sort of being a completely separate budget. So, what well, what we find is, is interesting is sort of the, um, the the stipulations, especially around each each customer and, and the retailers, right, and, and their networks is um, how we can run offers, what that looks like as the effect on the margin, um, how long we want, do we have to run media against them, what type of media, what sort of investment are they looking for? So it becomes a, a bigger and bigger challenge. Uh, and we've seen that in a lot of different ways through the growing pains this year uh, when we get a lot of incremental dollars, you know, the econ business grows, uh, more money, more problems, right? Um, it's a good problem to have sometimes, but we don't want to overinvest at this point. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's a lot about this stance of, of how do we connect these two things. And, you know, we know that uh, price, taste, and assortment are what drive our business, right? And so taste and assortment, you know, I'm not on the product team. I'm not creating, you know, the next flavor of Pepsi. That's not me right now. So uh, it becomes about, you know, price and promotion and getting, you know, the right offer to the right person at the right time. Um, Ajay, um, traditionally trade dollars have been allocated to in-store physical experience. Now over time, we're seeing demand shifting online. Um, from what I heard from you, this um, the trade dollars haven't shifted. Um, and um, what's the theory behind this? What do you think they the retailers haven't moved the trade dollars online? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll be blunt. I don't think they're incented to. All right, it's it's nice to be able to continue to keep those trade dollars whole, even if the offline sales are are uh, moving downwards. Uh, and ask for incremental on the, the dot com side. And, you know, I, I talked about this last year, uh, Andy, at, at this conference, was, at your conference, um, around just getting POS broken out from offline to online. Really challenging. Uh, you know, what's bought online to pick up in store? And then what's the right ratio of spend allocation within those G JBP dollars associated with that? So until there's like levels of transparency, it becomes challenging. And so there are choices therefore than the brand has to make to make sure that we're, we're fighting for incrementality on our, on our business. We're growing margins and we're growing a profitability and growing top line and bottom line. So, you know, I, I think it's the hard conversations. Uh, I think more sales folks are now getting pushed on that uh, to one, invest further on .com. But, uh, you know, I think really strong manufacturers are realizing they need to think about this holistically and inclusively because at the end of the day, there's only a finite amount of dollars. And if you're not growing top line, you're not getting additional shipments. Those dollars have to come from brand or elsewhere. Uh, and my fear in those situations is you're not growing category. You're not driving education. You're not driving education against new innovation or new products that are coming out, which actually long-term is going to affect both the retailer and the manufacturer uh, adversely. Um, Dan, I recall I interviewed Scott Galloway at our first conference um, two years ago, and this was the time when um, Amazon really started pushing hard on the sponsored products program and the whole advertising game um, really um, kicked off and started scaling. And 
Scott Galloway said something. Yeah, um, the whole thing is um, simply a sales tax. If you talk to the um, Amazon sales team, they will tell you how oh, this is amazing opportunities to position yourself on the platform and get way more scale and outcompete um, all the other companies. W how do you see this? Um, is, it, um, is it a tax um, or is it a huge opportunity? It's both. It's both is the simple answer. I mean, you know, you got to you got to pay to play. And I think, you know, for for large companies, they just sort of see that as like the next step of, OK, how do we, you know, how do we position things? How do we position our business? We just kind of have to, you know, shift our focus or hire on different you know, individuals to, you know, go work on the Amazon team. Right. Um, for instance. But, uh, you know, where uh, where I think it's it's uh, interesting, right, it is about that that fight for incrementality that, that AJ was talking for. If they can prove out incrementality, right, and they can give you the right measurement and run those, uh, those incremental lift studies, then, um, you know, if, if we're good with that and we believe the data and we verify that and it matches up to other things we, we've seen on similar customers, then, you know, it's not, the, uh, it's not the worst opportunity for us because, you know, we are driving share and that's where the eyeballs are, that's where the attention is, um, you know driving advertising, right? Low funnel on these media networks, be it Amazon Target, right? Uh, is this double-edged sword, right? It's this great opportunity. It's almost like shooting fish in a barrel, like, you know, retargeting to an extent. Um, but were they going to just purchase on their own anyway, especially if you have, you know, a big brand like, you know, your, uh, your shark vacuums or your, you know, uh, Fritos that everyone's going to be potentially buying anyway. Um, I would say the, the last piece of that that's maybe interesting um, is uh, is just that um, was this, where is it going with that? Um, I'll just wrap it up there. Yeah. Um, um, Ajay, let's take a macro um, perspective. Like um, former days, um, there was just trade budget being um, being spent, um, and the positioning within a retailer or a um, marketplace was just for free. There was no um, advertising being charged, and you were just organically listed. Now the rules of the game seem to have changed and um, you sell, um, you sacrifice margin, you sell to a retailer. And then in addition, you now um, are being charged to position yourself and to get your product across. Um, I'm just wondering how do the math play out? Because um, ultimately you're getting the same, but you're paying more. How are brands managing this? Yeah, look, I... I may disagree with Scott Galloway on this, so I'll just go on the record and say that uh, because you were paying that tax in POP, right? You're paying that tax on getting it into a circular. You were paying that tax elsewhere. And so I, I just map a lot of the stuff that we've done previously, old school, pre-internet, uh, offline. It's just moving online, right? You need display. You need, uh, you know, POP on, on shelf. That could be online, that could be offline, right? And so I think the the strategy now is the consumers are more, uh, more complex, right? It's not a finite shelf to the closest retailer near your home. Uh, they can open up literally seven tabs, price match, and determine what they're going to buy based off of ratings or reviews and, and brand and quality of product instantaneously. And so, and they'll get it uh, in some cases in hours uh, at their doorstep. <laughs> Um, so I, I, look, I, I think it's really critical that brands are looking at the holistic PL. They're looking at, you know, what's the total brand PL, what's the category PL, and then what's the customer PL and stitching it together. Uh, again, I, I said this very uh, directly can over invest, got to support, but got to be smart about what are the line items that are in there and then maniacally remove inefficiencies. I, I think Amazon's forced the whole industry to level up and, you know, their, their motto of your margin is my opportunity uh, is there. And so we have to take inefficiencies out of it. And if circulars aren't working as hard as they used to from 15 years ago, or, you know, in flyer coupons aren't working as hard, move it move it as quickly as possible and figure out what's the vehicle that gets you the same return or better uh, as you look forward. And I think there's opportunities. I think creative brands are figuring out how to find incrementality and are not seeing a margin crunch. They're actually seeing growth 
because they are going through the hard work of determining how to move those dollars and where to go move them. Um, efficiency, return, and then I mentioned measurability. You would be keen to invest more if you see success. How do you actually measure success? Um, if I mean, you see the reporting, right? You you get numbers, and but um, are you using these numbers to make um, ultimately to make investment decisions, or how do you deal with what you get back? How reliable is this? How to what extent does this reflect the real impact of your campaigns? Yeah, I mean, we we poke a lot of holes in what's uh, in what's sent our way. That's for sure. Um, You know, we were, uh, when we were all, you know, chatting a little earlier, right, um, every marketer has to be uh, extremely wary of the view through uh, conversion uh, or attribution, if you can even call it that, right? And so, um, you know, our uh, our partners will, you know, send through new uh, new offerings and they will, you know, tout 6, 7, 8x, 9x, row ads, you know, and that's lumping everything together, click, view, 30 days, you name it, right? And, you know, we just don't accept that, right? And so we tell them, You know, these are our standards, you know, click view, you know, click attribution only, you know, 14 day window, something like that. Right. And and how do we kind of uh, pull all that together? We have a, a retail team uh, and uh, they own oversee something we call it like an ROI engine. So we have a lot of pretty interesting capabilities in house where we are trying to pull that data, not just kind of take that one Excel report from, uh, you know, one campaign and, and one customer. Uh, but kind of pool all that together across all of our investments from the brand team to, uh, you know, the small DTC investments to our, you know, significant retail media investments uh, and, and kind of, uh, you know, compare them all on the same uh, on the same level playing field. So that's a big part of, of what we do when we kind of, you know, get those reports that sort of uh, blow the metrics or add in a lot of, you know, other metrics or influence sales, right, things that we're just extremely skeptical of, especially us you know, low funnel performance marketers. Um, but, you know, w one sort of point on, on all this is that uh, it doesn't always mean, you know, we're not seeing the, the returns. We, how much we invest or don't invest is only, I would say, to some extent, mildly influenced. I don't want to say that. We want to talk to our customers or partners, right, and say, like, they're very, like, important, you know, the, the return we get. But, you know, we do ultimately have the dollars to spend at, at such a large company on marketing investments. And this is one of those big ways. And so, you know, we do look at, okay, well, how much business are driving? How much of an investment are we typically uh, putting in based on that, right? What percent of sales, like, do we need to invest um, on e-com, on, on omni-channel? Um, and, and that last piece, I guess, which I sort of trailed off earlier was just thinking about the strategic relationship part of this too. Like it, that's what's been a real interesting kind of eye-opening experience for me is, uh, you know, okay, well, to some extent, you're sort of mandated or, you know, to, to invest uh, based on the JVPs, the agreements we have with our partners, right? Um, we can push them for a lot of stuff. And, uh, you know, what is the quid pro quo? What is the quid pro quo? What do we get in return? In a lot of cases, the marketing investment may not get the, the ROI we're looking for, but if it's unlocking shelf space that enables us to, uh, you know, find new opportunities for our new innovation products, right, to, uh, you know, execute really, you know, large scale launches for new items, stuff like that, um, compete with our, you know, our competitors and grow our share. Um, then, you know, there's other reasons for us to invest beyond just, okay, this is a good spot or not a good spot to like spend your marketing dollars. That's really, um, really interesting. I mean, um, basically, you what you're saying is that there are many aspects. A return investment is just one, um, one thing you're getting back, but there's also the relationship component. And so essentially, if it might not be there, there are other reasons to still invest. Um, Ajay, is this a relationship um, game or a media game? Uh, no, it's it's all above, right? And this is the art and science uh, of trying to stitch together CPG, omni-channel media strategy. Uh, so part of it is relationship. Part of it is showing that you are behind a new launch, uh, partnering for the betterment of the joint business. End of the day, success criteria is both, both teams need to win. And so the strategies around that have to be co-worked from my perspective. In some cases, you've got to show strategic weight behind 
things that you want to go after or the retailers seeking for you to go after. And other times it's a little more hard nosed, right? It is, they're going to ask you, did you turn X amount of dollars per store uh, or online or elsewhere? Uh, and we're going to have a conversation around ROI and all of those things. Because at the end of the day, everyone's trying to maximize their P&L, ensure they're growing their category and uh, ensuring that they're growing their share as best as possible. And so I think that's the kind of art and science and that's the like tactile feel of these conversations. And, you know, broadly speaking, that's why from my perspective, what's the most successful is getting all the stakeholders in a room uh, and aligning against that. And so that's the merchants, that's the buyers, that's the sales folks, that's the media teams. Uh, everyone's got to hold hands on what's actually going to drive a product to skew a category, a brand, uh, you know, for, for the collective whole. And then I think on the manufacturer side, it's then making internal strategic calls of how do you set up all the channels to be successful versus your competition and or road category. Uh, and that's, that's the imperative against it. Um, I mean, let's add some, some more complexity. We have the measurability problem. And um, I mean, look, um, we um, originally come from performance advertising. So not in a retail environment, but uh, mostly Google ads. And even there you see what you get, um, what you see is not necessarily what you get because there's um, retargeting bundled um, into prospecting and you get a blend of, um, yep. of something on um, in retail media it's even way more complicated because you're listed organically and all what happens is that now you populate additional ad inventory and you get some premium slots which doesn't mean you entirely disappear if you stop advertising on google text ads you're gone simply and so there's a higher incremental impact but now you have to deal with a multitude of different retailers using different tracking mechanisms diff different attribution different tech um, how is, do you perceive this from a brand perspective? Is it manageable or what would you want to see in order to actually, um, yeah, get a better return out of um, your investment um, and eventually also invest more money into this? Yeah, so Andy, it, it, it's complicated, right? Uh, obviously we would love a universal ID that uh, st stitches this all together and helps us better understand. I'll let the, the big boys, PepsiCo and others help to, you know, shape where the industry is going to go on that, that side of measurability. But in, in lieu of that, I think brands have to, you know, make sure that they're getting the most, the highest level of transparency back from any of the publishers, uh, retail, non-retail, uh, making sure that they're holding to at least similar, if not like standards, and then build uh, the necessary modeling. Uh, and that means building in many cases, either internal or external analytics groups to be able to underpin that. And that's taking in deterministic data, that's taking in probabilistic data, that's taking in retrospective analyses, that's taking in softer polling components against it and stitching it together and hoping, hoping that your coefficients are close enough to inform where you need to invest the next incremental dollar. But again, I think this is more art than science at this juncture. Let's pick up one question from, from the audience related to exactly this and let me phrase it um, a little differently. Um, so sometimes you get a post um, view tracking, for example, some others have a post click tracking. Um, any ideas how you, trans, uh, how you unify this, how you make um, the different tracking mechanisms comparable? Any experience with that? I don't, uh, I can comment quickly. I'm curious what Ajay's perspective would be, but uh, I think for, for us, uh, we're, we're much more focused on, on the long term. And so what that means would be, um, you know, you get your post, you get your, your post click, you can't compare them right now. Um, what, what we would instead say is like, how can we get like a, a data feed rather than, you know, singular reports we're pushing our our vendors for you know more near real time reporting access to self serve dashboards uh, even better right is going to be like an API connection so we can you know directly uh, pipe that into you know our Tableau setup with uh, everything in it right and so um, that ultimately is the, the way to kind of get the the full data view right and then kind of compare things much more apples to apples um, short term right there's not much we can we can do about that so we get two reports two different 
you know, campaigns or customers or, or, or channels, right? They don't match up. Um, it is what it is, right? We just sort of move on and sort of focus on longer term. How do we kind of make these uh, align? Yeah, Andy. So there's, there's, I agree. There's short term and there's long term. Um, there's also just how you want to position yourself as a manufacturer. What, what I like to sell is uh, we want to be cutting edge, leading edge. And so we're going to jointly figure out how to get there together. And in previous cases, we've pushed back on reporting. Uh, and we've asked for, you know, uh, Walmart used to do this offline attribution capability and it would juice up ROAS. It was really difficult to then, uh, you know, cross compare. And so we said, strip it. Uh, and it was challenging and we said, we're not investing anymore. Right. And so you just held the dollars off to the side saying, I'm ready to go. The, the dollars are just growing because I'm not flighting this right now. Uh, but you got to get reporting. Uh, I have shareholders, I have fiduciary responsibility and I have X amount of report. I would say that short term and then longer term is making sure that, uh, there's a joint collaboration on what needs to be true. Um, against, you know, that joint business plan that you're building out with the retailer, the publisher, uh, and that publisher could be Facebook, could be Google, and it can be Amazon, AMS, DSP, or Walmart Media Group, you name it. Picking up another quest right from the audience, um, also quite related to this year. I mean, we are hearing that um, like um, Amazon is eating um, a little bit of the budget which was previously invested into Google. So it's the question where you invest, um, is it DTC or is it um, on retail platforms? Um, do you treat these budgets um, separately or is it just rather one budget which you then kind of move from DTC to, to retail and back and forth? How does this work? So is there a cannibalization um, basically? It's hard, uh, hard for me to say. I mean, I just probably got a little bit of more of a bird's eye view. I think uh, there tended to be a, a finite amount of dollars and, and it is just a reallocation, whether that's offline to online, whether that's uh, you know, brand dollars, to retail media networks. Um, so yeah, I mean, for DTC, right, I think uh, our investments are uh, limited at this point. Um, and so it's not really, uh, I think, a, a big enough conversation for a company of to size to be concerned about those investments because they're really just testing their budgets at this point. Yeah, uh, the way I think about it is um, it matters. Manufacturer uh, and owners of the budget may sit out, uh, in many different places. So the ability to have shadow P&Ls or aggregated reporting is really critical. Uh, and again, I think about this as brand dollars, performance, call it DTC dollars and, and your trade retail dollars, shopper marketing all bundled together. And, you know, ideally, uh, the brands are seeing that in totality and is able to make the right choices and decisions. I, I'll say that not, I, I think it's a little hodgepodge out there. Some manufacturers have that, other manufacturers don't. Um, and I think it's situational to situational, but my reco uh, is to have at least some mechanism that drives internal consensus, internal reporting in a, in, in a singular dashboard. All right, guys, um, we had a long, long session. So I have tons of more questions, uh, which we can also take offline. But um, really, thanks um, for this great conversation. Thanks for taking the time and for sharing all your experiences with our audience. It was a pleasure having you here. Hope to um, see you next time post COVID in, um, in person um, as we are um, used to, maybe at some point of time. So thanks to everyone for um, listening in. Um, we're going to see each other next week again um, when it's about the complete guide to retail media monetization. As mentioned at the beginning, this is more lightweight, um, entertaining, easy to digest. You will see lots of visual examples on how retailers um, monetize their sites, good ads, not so good ads. So looking forward to it. Um, have a good rest of the day. Um, and see you soon again. Bye -bye. Thanks, Andy. Thanks so much, guys.